acknowledge Brian Clayton, who stepped into politics publicly to um, work with us on this campaign. He had he had um, intentionally maintained a nonpartisan approach to his work before, um, and stepped forward uh, to take on our social media and online communications. So if you just want to stand up, Brian. <laughs> And um, Sarah Miller was um, incredible in research and copywriting and supportive communications in general. Um, but I do want to say I'm the first Green Party City Councilor in Vancouver, hoping to be joined next uh, this October by Pete, with Pete Fry on this side. Uh, and I, um, I do want to just start by saying I am so ecstatic about what you've achieved here. This has been a dream for decades, literally. Didn't sleep for three nights <laughs> after election night. And just congratulations to all of you. I'm just my sincere thanks for all the effort put into this win. You've started it. <laughs> my question is this. Um, you talked about a switch happening in February or March, just prior to the election, when all of a sudden the Greens turned from being the last line in the news story to there are three major parties in BC. How did you achieve that? What were the things you actually concretely did to get there? Um, okay, I, so uh, the short answer is um, many, many things that all um, came together. <laughs> Not good enough. <laughs> yeah. um, but I, I would actually point back to a few things uh, that, that I already mentioned. Um, having Andrew be the center of the campaign, and um, to uh, the point before, the reason, what part of the reason he did a lot of the debates because, was because he was the only person that had a public, a big provincial public profile um, for these debates. And so prioritizing or putting him in the center of these things was important. Um, making um, significant um, announcements and making big media events out of them was critical as well. We had uh, the cover of the Vancouver Sun maybe two or three times during the election campaign. Um, and we I don't think we've ever had that before, unless it was maybe for something bad, I don't know. Um, <laughs> and um, I would say that really contributed as well. Yeah, I'll just add, um, for me the biggest, there's the tactical pieces, um, you know, choosing Vancouver for a lot of our announcements, etc. Um, the number one thing that I think made us successful um, was coming back to that question of why should people vote green in this election. Um, and I cannot overstate the amount of time we put in to figuring out our answer to that question and the importance of that to our, the success of this campaign because everything revolved around that. You know, what was we, the answer? Um, for plot, well, so this came out with you know, positive change people can trust, but the more important thing is that, I mean, that was the answer for that election that we arrived at. The uh, point I would make, though, is that I think, you know, what I've observed from campaigns in the past, sometimes when your parties have run, is that they've, um, they've talked about the things that they wanted to talk about that were important to them. And I think what we realize is that some of the things that are important to us aren't necessarily important to your, your average voter. And so we tried to figure out, okay, where's your average voter at? And where does that overlap with our values, the things we care about, and the context of this moment in time that is this election? Um, and you know, trust in politicians is a massive one. We didn't just ban corporate union. I mean, we did it out of principle. Um, and it was also a recognition that the reason we then ran on it, things like, you, know, you do it out of principle, you then run on it, and you highlight it as a major issue because it overlaps with the issues that people care about and what drives that distinction between um, you know, the different parties. And I think what we did well is we positioned ourselves um, where the debate was happening. We recognized that we couldn't define the debate ourselves in this election. The NDP and the Liberals were going to be brought to find the, you know, the, the, um, the, the playing field. We had to make sure that we positioned ourselves in the playing field in a way that carved out that space for that coverage for us. That makes sense. One, one other thing, oh sorry. Yeah, I just, I, if I can just jump in, because I think I want to just expand very quickly on it. I think the two biggest pieces, one is sort of the action of the other. We, and, and I think this is true for us going forward, we need to tell people less the values we think they should possess, and we need to listen a lot more to the values that we already share, and start from that point. Because that is the only way we're going to continue. That's frankly why there are so many new amazing people in this party now, 
is because we, I think, took a really strategic approach that, that didn't involve telling people the things that they should have. And I, I think a really good example of this is actually on pipelines. We have a very um, consistent and, and fixed and, and firm opinion on what should be done with pipelines. We also, though, made a very strategic decision to not run this election on pipelines because that issue is not a defining issue for how people cast their votes. It's an example, but we used it as part of the trust narrative. Who do you trust to do what they say? It wasn't about the pipeline thing. And that difference, I think, is, in, is infinitely important because people, that's what this election for a lot of people were about. Our accessible voters cared about trust. They cared about who was going to do what they say. So all of those issues became about that value that we shared with a lot more people than if we had said, pipelines are bad and they shouldn't be through any community in British Columbia. Well, there's a lot of people that disagree that otherwise might have come along and said, you know what, I, I care about consistency more than anything else. Um, and I'm just going to add one thing and then we'll move to Judy because she has uh, so much knowledge um, and experience to share with us as well. Um, I think uh, another piece of that was we talked confidently about what we stood for and what we could accomplish, we believed, what we believed in ourselves. Um, and, you know, I remember in 2014 when Andrew first announced to some uh, groups of people that we were running for government. I don't think I need to tell you what the reaction was um, at that time. But now it's not something that we're, um, that we're afraid to say. And the reason for that is uh, because we said that consistently until people believed it, um, basically. Um, but we showed it as well in the actions uh, that, that we took as a party, running as full a slate a campaign as possible, that sort of thing. Um, and um, people, again, going back to the legitimacy thing, why people don't vote for you or for us, uh, they don't think we can win. Well, sometimes if we talk about ourselves like we can't win, then we're just reinforcing that. And so we told people, you can vote for us because we can win and, and we want to win and, and we're going to. I'll agree part of the majority, 2018 Vancouver. <laughs> so we need to um, just move to Judy now so that she can... We, we're gonna... Um, we'll have more Q&A though, after uh, Judy. Uh, my name is Lily, as uh, some of you uh, heard last night, or probably most of you heard last night. And uh, it's my pleasure to welcome Dan O'Neill to join, uh, join me today with this uh, workshop. He is a visiting professor at the University of Victoria, even though he is a Victoria boy himself. Um, he is uh, currently a lecturer at the University of Leeds in England. I like the international flavour, it's just that I'm the international flavour, not him. <laughs> um, so, so today, uh, what I'm going to do is to introduce the discussion about shiny objects versus genuine progress. And um, I am going to, well, somewhat, uh, should we say, uh, hopefully thought-provoking, not, I'm not trying to give you all the answers here, but to stimulate some questions in your mind. Um, I will talk about shiny objects, Dan will talk about genuine progress, and uh, then we will have some time for you to discuss this at your tables. Uh, this is a workshop and not a lecture, so um, I hope that uh, we will stimulate a lot of thought and get some good discussion going. So, first of all, shiny objects. What do we mean by shiny objects? And for me, the thing with shiny objects is, um, you know, it's quite a personal idea. This is my holiday. I told you this last night. So I'm on holiday now. And so I thought maybe what I'd do is show you my holiday snaps. <laughs> um, this is me at Lichtown. And for those of you who uh, know where Lichtown is, it's at the very end of the Galloping Goose. And Lichtown is... Right, what we will plan to do. And then we hope to hear from you because this is an opportunity for us to listen to hear your concerns, to hear your issues, to uh, ask you what, uh, for you to ask us questions, because it's, you know, you're here and we're here and we're here to listen and answer your questions or, or listen to your ideas. Um, I'd like to just start by talking about this, the opportunity we have now. This is quite a historic event. 
Uh, we went, came, went into the election viewing that we had strong support across British Columbia. We came away with 17% of British Columbians supporting us. And that was, that was higher going into the last week, but a, a fear-based campaign on vote splitting dropped us in a couple of key ridings that we could and should have otherwise run one. But we came out with a, with a, with a, a result that was our dream. A result was that the BC Green held the balance of power in any legislation that was um, going to um, um, uh, move forward. So when we came out of that, on the evening of the election, some of you were there, I had conversations with both the Premier and with Mr. Horgan, and at that time there was an element of excitement. I could see the excitement in Mr. Horgan's voice, and, hear that, and I, the Premier, the former Premier, was quite tired. We then entered into negotiations, and one of the things we wanted to promise is we wanted to promise that, that we gave certainty to British Columbia. So what, for us, it was very important that we reached an agreement to support a premium um, prior to the rent being returned so that markets, British Columbia, had a sense of certainty. We entered in good faith into negotiations with both the BC and the NDP and the Liberals. Now, some will ask, why didn't you just let things happen and take things issue by issue? It's not quite how it works because the very first thing the government has to do is determine that it has the confidence of the House. We campaigned on change you can count on. Uh, it's not clear to, to us that change means status quo. Uh, it, it felt, we felt that change was important, um, uh, an important component of, of, of our negotiations. Now change was manifested in two different ways in our negotiations. One, for the BC Liberals, it manifested in a complete change in their throne speech. Uh, and, and, and for, for the BC NDP, it, was, it meant that they came our way on some of the issues that were dear to our heart. So ultimately, when asked, if ever asked, why is it that you signed with the, with the, with the NDP and, and not the Greens and not the Liberals, is the answer is this. We had, to, we had to come to an agreement with someone for certainty. We had to give an indication that there would be a confidence vote would pass, the first, first thing that should happen. And we did determine that it was in the best interest of British Columbia to, to actually have that confidence be given to a new premier. Now in the uh, actual agreement, the thing that, that was the sealer for me, and I won't speak on behalf of Sonia or Adam, was that I asked the question, why is it I got into politics in the first place? I left uh, a, a good paying position at the University of Victoria as a climate scientist, one of my colleagues, Greg, here at IOS, I've known Greg for years as a other climate scientist. I, I couldn't sit back, back and write more papers on the issue of climate science and not, and not do something about it. So I ran because of the climate issue. I saw the BC Liberals and the Christy, Christy Clark dismantling climate policy. I saw the BC NDP, you know, wavering on, on what they would do about it. And I remember the 2009 Axe Attacks campaign. So I got in because of climate. And when it came down to signing an agreement, the question I had is, which, which party do we think we could actually advance good climate policy with most effectively? And it was clear that that was not going to happen with the BC Liberals, but that it could and would happen with the BC NDP. Very quickly, in terms of background, you my husband is actually a Green from the United States, and so that should really tell you how green he is. <laughs> Seriously. Like, whew, we've been together 20 years, and um, yeah. But what always fascinated me about him being a Green was how it seemed to me that the party didn't seem to really realize how they were naturally a fit for so many minoritized communities and how there always seemed to be a lack of reaching into those spaces. And that was always something that was interesting to me. So when we made the decision to um, immigrate here to, be, to Canada. And that way we'll see what the whole party is about, and that will lead to greater engagement, and I welcome that day. Thank you. And it would pass if we had 50% or more people supporting it. If it's special business, and we do have some special, we potentially do have some special business during this session, if a vote is done on special business, it's by a special motion, and that requires a 75% threshold to pass. And that's a, a, a Society Act imposed requirement. Also for this session, we're, we're using what's, what's called me again, uh, David Gagnon from Vancouver Hastings. Um, I just wanted to clarify the use of the card. So in building consensus, my 
rough idea from a few other people in the room is that when we come to a vote, the yellow card is no longer about questions. It's about uncertainty, but not blocking consensus. So in that last round, 